Good morning or good afternoon. Um, hello and welcome to the third and the last of the 2021 virtual TANF sessions for the eastern side of the United States for our states and territories. My name is LaMonica Shelton and I'm with the Administration for Children and Families and Office of Family Assistance and I work with the states in the southeastern part of the country. So we have a full day or full afternoon planned for you where we will focus on adapting client-centered approaches to a virtual environment. So what do we mean by this title? Well, it's no secret that COVID has wreaked havoc on our lives across the country. It has impacted us at home and at work. But what we would like to do today is explore how TANF programs have been moving forward in the midst of COVID and how we can continue to move forward to better serve our staff, our participants, and our communities. In other words, how have we pivoted already and how can we continue to pivot while operating in this new normal and beyond? More specifically, we will build on our two previous sessions where we looked internally and learned about how to respond to your and your staff's needs during COVID, and then we discussed how to help clients reach long-term success. Today, we will explore how you serve clients in a virtual setting as you assess and respond to their needs. We will also explore um, how uh, programs have dealt with issues related to IT access, and we will explore um, how we do a leap forward with innovative ideas that come from lessons that we've already learned. We understand that the way we have done these three sessions is different from it's been in years past. Some of us are starting, are still working from home. We have children trying to take classes online. We have dogs barking in the background. We might have a spouse or someone else in the household on a conference call with an earshot. Or we might even hear the sound of a neighbor's leaf blower outside like I heard this morning through my window. We all have a lot going on around us, yet we are also receiving such rich information today while staring at this little small screen. So please, please feel free to stand up, stretch where you are whenever you need to, keep a drink or a snack nearby, but just put into practice what we've been talking about regarding taking care of you. And so now um, I'd like to turn things over to Steve McLean from BLH Technologies. He's going to share some important information with you. And then Steve will be followed by a first panel, which will be moderated by Jackie Rhodes, Senior Manager within ICF's Workforce Innovations and Poverty Solutions Portfolio. Thank you. Steve? Thanks, Monica. We just wanted to run through a couple of quick housekeeping items. I think for some of you, this may be your first meeting. Others of you have seen this before, uh, but we wanna make sure everyone knows where to get the, the, the materials from the session. So Visible is the main platform where we're hosting this session. Uh, the agenda is available there, speaker information. You can click on a speaker to see their full bio and also session materials. So any PowerPoint that you see or resource um, that is mentioned as a handout will also be available on that agenda page. Uh, we'll also work to provide you with a, a share drive folder that would have provide you access to those materials as well if you're having issues with Visible. Zoom is where the main presentation will take place. This will be a, an interactive meeting. So we hope that you at any point will submit questions through the chat box for the presenters. Uh, feel free to ask for assistance if you're having technology issues. Uh, and also feel free to submit ideas or suggestions or lessons learned that you've had that are related to the presentations that you will see. Uh, we will engage folks in dialogue in the chat box throughout. So we look forward to hearing from you and all of the um, resources and information that you can provide to your colleagues as well. There will be a couple of poll questions that will appear on your screen and you can vote directly there, as well as a survey at the end of the session where we just wanna get a little bit of feedback from you on how the session was and to make sure that we can make them useful for, to, for you in the future. Uh, so now I wanna turn this over to our moderator, Jackie Rhodes, who will discuss the upcoming panel. Thanks, Steve, and hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jackie Rhodes, and like LaMonica said, I work for ICF in our Workforce Innovations and Poverty Solutions Group, and we work closely with BLH and OFA to plan and hold these meetings for you, so I'm excited to be here today. Um, our meeting's gonna be segmented into three sessions. 
today, and we're going to start first with adapting client-centered approaches to a virtual environment. Um, and we're going to focus on um, thinking about deploying trauma-informed strategies in this sense. So um, we're going to feature a brief context-setting discussion about the importance of participant lived experience and strategies human services programs can use in responding to participant needs. And then that will be followed by two state spotlights that describe their experiences adapting, um, deploying, and assessing trauma-informed practice in a virtual setting. So as we move through the session today, um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers. Their full bios are on the Bizabo platform if you'd like to learn more about them. And um, I also just wanted to flag a few more housekeeping things before we kick off. So um, there's an optional resource tool that Steve mentioned. Um, this tool was sent to you by email. It's also available in the chat. If Sujina, you can pop it in there. Um, and this is just intended to be a tool to help you with identifying and capturing some key takeaways as you're reflecting on the topic uh, throughout the session today. So feel free to use that if it's helpful. And then we're also going to hold a brief Q&A at the end of this session. Um, so if you have questions as you're hearing from the speakers, feel free to enter them in the chat. Um, we'll be collecting them and then we will um, moderate a quick uh, Q&A session depending on how much time we have left to ask those questions. So today our three speakers include Dr. Laurel Kaiser from the Family Informed Trauma Treatment Center, Diana Cockrell from the Washington State Healthcare Authority, and Melissa Bocash from the Vermont Agency of Human Services. So we're gonna kick off with Dr. Kaiser. She's gonna set the context for today. She's a psychologist and an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And she leads the Family Informed Trauma Treatment Center um, which is a National Ch Child Traumatic Stress Network Category 2 Center. So, Laura, I will pass the mic over to you to get, get us started. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for organizing this and inviting me uh, to come to uh, speak. And I'm going to spend um, just a few minutes talking about the intersectionality between poverty, trauma, and COVID-19 and some tips for your client, your clients as you work with them through virtual platforms. Next slide. So um, poverty is a context that um, many of your clients live in. And, um, you know, in all clinical services, it's really important, to, or in all service delivery, it's really important to recognize context. And we know that um, in many service systems, um, context erasure is a big problem. But to provide trauma responsive services, we must acknowledge that poverty is a traumatic context um, for many people who live in poverty. Next slide. Living in poverty means um, increased risk of experiencing many types of trauma, increased risks of exposure to heightened daily hassles and multiple stressors, and then um, a, a constant in the context of poverty is living with continued threats. Um, so, so the sense of not knowing um, that things are predictable and controllable uh, in life. And um, that kind of sense of ongoing threat is often coupled with fewer resources to protect oneself from the harmful effects of that context and also having to focus on survival, which leads many people to uh, kind of be in ongoing crisis management mode. Next slide. We know that um, in the trauma field, we talk a lot about that crisis management mode and um, the, the ability of our biological or physiological system to deal with um, ongoing threat. And most of the attention is focused on our uh, stress system, um, which really prepares the body to deal with threats and dangers through our fight, flight, or freeze response. 
but equally important um, to how we regulate and cope with trauma and high stress are our attachment and safety systems, which help us develop and maintain the ability to connect with others and to use those connections to deal in healthy ways with stress and trauma. And all three of these systems are interdependent and interrelated and work together to keep our system in a healthy, um, in a healthy balance um, and to accommodate to the context that we find ourselves in. And when systems or contexts are loaded with threats, dangers, and trauma, um, all three of those, these systems readjust to deal with those ongoing threats, often causing wear and tear on these systems, um, as well as um, lots of dysregulation. Next slide. So if we live in our traumatic context for long enough, we rely on, uh, we develop and rely on the same tools we use in life-threatening situations to deal with everyday stressors. So we treat everyday life as if we're in a heightened and life-threatening situation. Next slide. And this leads to the development of some um, common survival tools. Um, and here are some highlights of those, but um, we, we really um, highlight fractures in our sense of safety, um, in, in our ability to regulate our systems, um, including those three systems we just talked about. Um, which can lead to a lack of, of what I call deliberateness, which leads to chaos um, and problems with connectedness. So although these tools help us in survival mode, they may not be helpful to your clients as you assist them. In fact, they may go, get in the way of your ability to work um, uh, successfully with your clients and um, although um, I, they're important to address and you've probably developed lots of ways to address them in person, um, they're also really important to address when you're dealing with people virtually. Next slide. So that includes um, ways to um, create deliberate um, spaces for people to model structure and predictability, to help provide co-regulation and crisis management, um, and uh, to um, provide lots of resources um, just in new ways. Um, and so we're going to talk through and spend just a few minutes thinking about some ways that these, these um, keys can be uh, supported virtually. So one, next slide please. One way is, is to um, take steps to ensure predictability and safety of virtual interactions. Um, and this may mean um, figuring out multiple ways of connecting with your clients. So you may want to use multiple platforms, including um, telephone, text message, virtual platforms, virtual meetings, but make sure that you have regularly scheduled sessions and then try and build a routine into the sessions um, for the time that you spend with your clients. Um, this is really important to make them comfortable um, on multiple platforms when you're communicating with them in different ways. Um, so if you start, for instance, your session with a client with a grounding technique, do that each time consistently and then start to work on their goals or uh, anything else you're planning to do with them. Having an agenda up front that you might go over with them or send them in advance is, is also a way to, to make the sessions predictable 
and um, help help them know what what you're planning to do with them. Um, if you're um, using virtual platforms, I think it's really important to talk up front and directly with your clients about um, their safety and privacy concerns about letting you into their home or into their space um, virtually. And um, to set up plans to deal with um, issues of privacy, if they don't have the privacy they want to be able to talk to you, um, how can you help them structure their space and their ability to, to be in contact with you in ways that do assure privacy? Um, and um, what kinds of um, uh, structures or plans can you have um, in terms of safety if you pick up on cues that um, they're not feeling safe in the context that they're in? Um, how, how would you, uh, how would they cue you about that and let you know about those safety concerns? And um, it's really important to have these plans in place and then go over them with your clients um, and even perhaps practice some um, regulation strategies, uh, some um, stress inoculation practices with your clients um, and practice them even when they're not needed. Um, they work really well virtually. Um, I know that you've probably developed things that you do to help ground and calm people face to face, but it's really important to know how to do that virtually. Next slide. It's also really important um, to help with resources and connections in the virtual world. Um, even in a virtual space, you can wrap resources around your clients. Um, as I said, use multiple uh, ways of connecting. Um, we, we have found that when we're working with families virtually, it's quite helpful to connect with them in multiple other um, ways as well, um, including if you're going to be using materials, mailing materials out to them, we um, also help provide um, a virtual space for clients to be able to receive um, documents or paperwork that they're going to be doing. We use Google Classrooms, but a vir virtual classroom with a folder for each family is a way to help them um, have multiple modalities to be able to work with you. Um, we're also, um, we usually meet in person with families and, and one of the things that we do is often is provide food as a way of nurturing and, and again, providing a safe environment. So we're sending food, supplies, goods, um, self-care materials to clients as often as possible. Um, and then it, I think it's really important to find ways of connecting interpersonally that are non-threatening. Um, but how, how do you do that virtually? For instance, where is it that you look on your uh, screen or camera to, to appear to be making eye contact? Um, what type of body language or gestures do you use with somebody um, who needs to um, be calmed or centered as you're working with them? What tone of voice do you use? Um, and so it's really important to consider that um, things like eye contact, um, where you're looking, what um, body language you're using, and the use of prosodic speech um, stimulates our parasympathetic nervous system to help us calm down. So remember to think about your rhythm, your tones, your pauses, um, where you're looking in the camera, and uh, what tone of voice you're using in terms of um, making a safe space for people. Thanks, and you're going to hear a lot more about that from, uh, from the other presenters. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laurel. I really enjoyed hearing um, kind of how the 
the practical side and those tips and how they kind of come out of the research you shared. So thank you so much for making those connections. Um, let's now shift gears. We're going to hear from two states today, Washington and Vermont. Um, so we're going to start with Diana Cockrell from the Washington State Health Ed Healthcare Authority, Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Um, she has experience working in the substance use treatment and mental health fields, and her work focuses on trauma-informed whole person, whole family care. So Diana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. I am grateful to be here to talk about trauma-informed approach today. Um, I just love following Dr. Kaiser. What a, a beautiful setup and framework. Um, so uh, we will cover the first few slides in this deck today. There's a lot more in the deck on implementation uh, ideas, if you'd like to read more. Um, one quick highlight for definition I'd like to make, speaking of having things happen in your background, that was a great setup, thank you. Um, so one quick highlight to distinct uh, several, just setting the stage. Um, there's a difference between trauma treatment and trauma informed approach. And many of you I'm sure already know this, but I just wanna point it out. So when we're talking about trauma treatment, we're talking about treatment that's the evidence-based clinical approach used by a trained therapist to treat trauma. Trauma informed approach is the way we do what we do, no matter what our role or place in our agencies, our families, or our communities. Um, and it's recognizing that each individual comes to an interaction with a unique context, history, and experiences that inform the choices in how they're going to interact with the world in that setting um, in order to maintain physical and psychological safety. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the brain for a minute. Um, this is uber high level. Um, so I, I love, uh, let's see, let's say whether you provide direct connection support with customers or your role is serving people who do, this applies. Um, when we're building recognition of which brain we're seeing the world in and which brain we're um, coming from ourselves, as well as uh, the people that we're talking with or connecting with. This is a, a nifty model that um, I've used with people I'm working with just to set a stage for what kind of day we're having so that um, we can start out the conversation from here if we need to. The idea with this is that uh, your hand is a model of a brain and the, the primal brain, which is the part of the brain that um, engages fight, flight, or fawn, essentially surviving this moment to get to the place where I can be safe, and that can be physically or psychologically. Yeah, it has genetic uh, connections. It's unique and individual in how it plays out for each person. Um, those personal experiences, both history, adverse childhood experiences, personal experiences since childhood, um, our community or the place that we come up in, our family, natural support, dynamics, um, and learned coping. Then we have the executive function, which the idea with that is it's the prefrontal cortex part of the brain, which um, is the part that helps us make decisions based on more than just instinct. So it's looking at cause and effect reasoning, um, understanding that if I make this choice today, these things will happen in the next few days or years because of that choice. It's the ability to recognize fear which is from here and think through it um, versus reacting to the experience of fear, recognizing potential threat, threats and being able to see a broader perspective than just what the primal brain will give. So an example of that could be if I'm out on the street walking down the road, walking down the sidewalk and I see somebody coming running and it looks like they're running right at me. First brain instinct says what's happening and I'm um, getting ready to respond to stay safe. And if my executive function is engaged, I'm able to see broader than the person running at me and see that there's either a cab that's waiting for them they're trying to get to or a friend that they're meeting coming up behind me um, that, that it isn't actually about me. A couple additional points to consider with this. The primal brain overrides executive function when it's lit up, when there's an experience <clears throat> that triggers um, 
the need for safety in some way. That trigger can be known or unknown to the individual experiencing it. So uh, um, the common survival tools that Dr. Kaiser mentioned are generally that instinctual response to something that um, we may or may not be aware of happening. We, the people we're talking with, people around us, whoever's experiencing it. Um, also the frontal lobe, the executive function, isn't fully developed until 25-ish. Um, so if we're working with someone who's younger, that part of the brain may not even be fully developed and wired to um, operate to its full capacity. So it's something to keep in mind. Also, um, experiences of trauma, substance use, mental health conditions can create uh, delayed development um, socially, emotionally, and cognitively. Um, so even if we're talking with someone who is beyond the age where the executive function should you know, typically be fully formed, there are, um, there are things that can delay the development of some of the skills um, to really fully engage and use the executive function. Next slide. Uh, this is just a visual. Um, so it's, uh, we're looking at a tree and its roots. The adverse childhood experiences are laid out across the tree branches and adverse community experiences are laid across its roots. Um, the, the visual, I think, can assist in recognition of different impacts of life pre-pandemic and really drive home the further impact and uh, uh, disparity of the pandemic for those that we serve, as well as our teammates, our bosses, our staff, each of us and our, our families. Um, we are perhaps all much closer to a flipped lid to the Dan Siegel, Dr. Dan Siegel model than when our old baseline pre-pandemic. Next slide. That folds into this slide with the importance of remaining diligent in seeing the context in which our customers come to us, the awareness of leading into understanding what our uh, uh, implicit or implicit biases, unimplicit biases might be. Um, Dr. Isaiah Pickens um, shares it very eloquently when he talks about historical, cultural, and generational wounds or traumas that continue to impact how we see the world. Uh, some of those examples, if we think about even relatively modern times, the slave trades of uh, African American people, the subsequent Jim Crow laws, marriage equality laws, uh, takeover of lands and the massacre of Native Americans, the Holocaust, um, the AIDS wars, Japanese internment camps during World War II. While this is just a short list of many of the things that have impacted generations um, of, of our country, folk, people um, that we are around every day, um, it's important to also remember that they, these things are government sanctioned on some level. And there is a, um, an earned mistrust that comes with our history that we um, need to acknowledge and recognize in our interactions <clears throat> with each other um, and with our clients and with our staff. Next slide. <clears throat> SAMHSA has great guidance on what trauma-informed is and how to include it intentionally in an agency or a practice. There are six core principles, four key assumptions. The slides at the end of this deck have those broken out with some examples for virtual um, interaction that we will not cover today in our time. Um, um, I think if, you know, if we're linking this with this presentation, Dr. Kaiser's safety guidelines uh, are a great jumpstart and things that are already happening, I'm sure, across the country, which is really great. The, another important note for trauma-informed to be real in an organization, it needs to be at the delivery level, the supervision level, the agency leader level. Everybody in, an, in a group, in a team, in an agency plays a role in creating a culture. And trauma-informed is a culture, not a checklist. If we aren't doing it for each other and as part of what is our standard of operation, 
it won't roll out to the customers that we serve in the way that we would like. Um, so to close out, I'm going to tell you a story to help visualize trauma-informed approach. Um, and this will be told as an in-person in -person event, but you're going to hear great examples of trauma-informed virtual work, uh, both from Dr. Kaiser, but also the speakers who are going to do um, the rest of these presentations today. Um, as we go through this, my hope is that you will notice your physical and emotional and thought reactions as the options unfold. Those are keys to knowing if in our interactions with others, um, what we're doing is trauma-informed or if we're missing the mark. It's very individualized and nuanced. Um, and it can be easy at times, especially if our stress level is high, to come into a situation the way we want to, the way we need it to be, the way we expect, versus coming in with a framework and context of understanding the person that we're meeting. Um, in context of them and hearing what their goals and their desires are, which is that shift that we need. So as you experience physically, emotionally, um, psychologically, these different layouts of trauma-informed, um, my hope is you can hang on to those keys and listen to how they show up in your day-to-day -day work. Okay, here's the story. Uh, here it is. We need to go to the dentist's office. I've put it off as long as possible. We've been thinking about it, festering on it mentally and emotionally, need to go, have needed to. It's been that stressor that's just always hanging there. Finally, get to the place where I cannot wait any longer. I have to make the appointment. I have to go in. So I call clinic one, and the person who answers the form is warm, understanding, answers questions, finds a day and time that works in my schedule, gives insight um, on what to expect when I walk in, how to prepare, how long to plan for, all of those things. On the other hand, we call clinic two. This call doesn't go as well. The person who answers is clearly not having a good day, keeps interrupting to put, on, put you on hold, um, is irritated with questions, vague about what to expect, uh, gives you a time and date that doesn't work, but if you wanna come in, that's the date you're gonna take. Um, won't offer another one, uh, it's take it or leave it. So think about psychological safety and already before ever walking in the door, how you're feeling. Now we're going to go to the dentist. Clinic one, uh, it's warm. The patient, uh, the, their staff is patient and responsive. Um, the equipment, the rooms, the offices are set up for comfort and acoustics. The sounds are warm. Staff asks how I'm doing and they actually listen. Um, ask what, um, what, what, why, why I'm here and um, what, I keep changing my pronouns, but we would like to have uh, leaving accomplished. So what's the goal? How do we help you get there? First is clinic two, where we walk in, the staff is clearly stressed. There's glass partitions between me and them. The sounds are echoey and clangy. The lights are really bright and fuzzy. Hard chairs, the Muzak speakers have screechy sounds coming from them. Staff are going through their checklist, leaving no space for talking freely or, um, or sharing what the need is, ask what's wrong with you, um, and uh, their body language and facial expressions indicate they just want this to be over with. So if we think about the difference between the clinic one and clinic two and notice how uh, much more challenging the situation is, even the best trauma-informed dentist, the person doing the service, um, how much more time and effort they have to put in with you to attempt to engage your learning brain and create safety and, and relaxation once you get in that chair. Each one of us has a choice in what kind of culture we support and participate in, and I am grateful to get to be in a room um, and a presentation with a bunch of champions for this work. I know you are. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Diana. That was great. All right, just in the interest of time, we'll move right into our last presenter for this panel, and that is Melissa Bocash. Um, she is a benefit program assistant administrator of Reach Up, which is Vermont's TANF program, and she's worked with the Reach Up program for over 10 years. She oversees the Good News Garage and the post secondary education program in the state. So, uh, Melissa, please go ahead. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about how Vermont and how we implemented our um, kind of going virtual. So we want to go to the next slide. So I wanted to give you a little history just because I think this is such a great resource is um, prior to COVID, we worked with um, PRTA to create a building trauma informed temporary assistance for needy families program an evaluative toolkit. So this, this we worked on with our, our staff, our community partners, our participants in the program to develop this tool it is a great resource. I will say it does not include a lot of um, information on virtual case management because it was prior to COVID, but I just wanted to give that link in case anybody was interested in taking a look at that. So we can go to the next slide. So from our work with the trauma-informed toolkit, we wanted to become more of a client-centered program. You know, approaching case management a little differently to more of a coaching model. So we developed or that many of people are using as well is kind of the goal achievement model or using the goal plan do review revise process to help families using their intrins intrinsic motivation to develop meaningful goals and kind of walking them through achieving those goals and helping them achieve them. So this has been very important in our role of virtual case management that I'll get into a little bit later. So we can go to the next slide. So virtual case management. So we, like many programs, have been completely virtual since March of 2020. So we are just approaching our year anniversary, or we're a little over. Um, to get started, we definitely had to make a lot of programmatic changes. And, um, you know, and we were fortunate with COVID, we were able to make a few um, rule changes that are temporary. We're kind of unsure when we'll go back to those, but we've also have been able to have taken an opportunity to really look at our program and see what could we turn more user friendly as we kind of all transition into this virtual world. And as everything um, becomes a little bit more accessible to people, what could we change? What changes could we make? So we were able to do a lot of that. It was a slow start. Um, I will say it took the first six months of a lot of um, revising, revisions, and changes, but then I think we've kind of been settled in a little bit more in the last few months than we were at the beginning, but it's really helped us to build strong relationships with our, um, with our participants in our program. So we can go to the next slide. So technology. Um, you know, I was saying last time, I really should rename this to communication and relationships, because with with switching to virtual case management, it really had to adapt our how do we build relationships with individuals. You know, we're used to either seeing them in our offices, seeing them in the community, or going to their homes, and we are not able to do that right now. So how can we replace that relationship building with technology? So we've done a lot of work on this. Um, many of our interactions are happening over the phone. We are also using text and email. Oftentimes we're using text and email to do a lot of pre and post work with individuals. I think as we just heard, you know, it's really helpful if there's like an agenda or a plan for the meeting. So we are trying to make sure that if there's any forms we need throughout the meeting that we're getting those out, you know, ideally using text and email, we definitely are sending things through the mail as well as needed. Um, but we're just, um, making sure that families are feeling safe and empowered during the meeting as much as they can to kind of feel that they have the control of the meeting and they're um, they know what's going on when we're while we're meeting. We are trying to transition to doing more face to face or it, what we have available is Microsoft Teams meetings, so we can. Um, be able to see each other and we're kind of getting back to that face-to-face -face type of interaction but we're still allowing the family to get is feeling safe there are some pros and cons of that it doesn't technology doesn't always work for everyone so we're definitely encouraging everyone to always have a backup plan we don't want to spend hours and hours trying to connect to microsoft teams with somebody or even minutes we don't want to spend you know 20 minutes so if we do um, are struggling with that. We want to always convert back to like a phone call or if it's a quick text that, hey, today's not going to work, let's try tomorrow or something along those lines. But the beauty of 
being face-to-face -face, is we're not only able to see each other, we're also able to share resources with individuals as they're in real time, that we're able to talk, um, share screens and show, um, show forms that we're working on and stuff like that. So that has been really helpful. Overall, we've found that the relationship piece with technology has been a really positive one we you know it has transitioned over the year at first we were maintaining relationships and I think that was fairly easy but then as the years gone on we've had to build new relationships as new participants have come on the program and uh, we've had a lot of success and oftentimes families are feeling more empowered with us and more willing to share information that is helpful and they're in working on their goals with us um, using technology and meeting virtually. Um, has been really helpful. We can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we've found with virtual case management that's been really a positive thing is helping reduce barriers. Vermont is a very rural state. So being able to eliminate transportation has probably been one of the biggest things that we've had for our um for our staff or for our participants being able to eliminate that stress of how are they going to get to our office or how are we going to get to this community meeting with it's been very helpful and it's definitely helped families a lot the other one is children that are home doing remote learning or lack of child care that is still definitely pretty happening quite often in most of our communities throughout Vermont. So it has been help it has been very helpful for parents to not have to stress as much about where are their children going to go during the meeting and or do they have to bring multiple children with them to the meeting. So it's been really helpful. And the last one has been really helpful for both faculty or staff, sorry, thinking of school faculty, um, for both our participants and our families and our and our mostly and also our staff is flexibility. It's allowed that we're we're more available now with to families when we're not on the road traveling to meetings. We're not in face to face meetings as much, um, especially via text and email. We're very available for participants, which has been helpful. It also allows families to meet when it works for them a little bit more. So if we're you know later in the morning or later in the day meeting with people has been helpful for um, a lot of participants when they're maybe their spouse is home to, to help with the children, um, or somebody else can help watch them in the evening when school's done and such. So it's really that flexibility piece has been huge. So we can go to the next slide. So virtual case management and the goal achievement model, really we have found that switching to the goal achievement model has been very a positive one through um, the virtual case management, allowing families to really focus on what is important to them and what motivates them has been helpful. We've found a lot of families, education has been huge, that's, there's been an increase in training opportunities, um, and just families feeling very empowered to choose their own goals. Um, and a few things, these are things that case managers have said, that conversations have been more, um, more meaningful as they're having them with families um, throughout the goal achievement model. Um, and we are just able to just communicate more frequently. So we can go to the last slide. Two minutes left. And so one thing I didn't mention at the beginning that I meant to is that we are still in the process of trying to gather data to see how has engagement been um, with families over the course of virtual case management. We've heard from a lot of people that families are more engaged and they are enjoying these virtual meetings more than they were when they um, were doing face-to-face -face meetings. We've seen a lot more uh, less cancellations or families not attending. Um, case managers are more available to their clients. I think like I just said, they're um, more meaningful conversations and overall more focused and productive. So lots of positive things have come out of the case management. Um, I think the other thing that uh, we have done a lot of is getting very creative with our support services that we have available for families. So it's like in Vermont, we call them support services. So this is extra money that we can help with like car repairs and stuff like that. We're finding that we're not spending as much on like transportation related things, but shifting more towards technology that is needed to be able to communicate with not only us, but with their families and helping them achieve their goals. 
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was fantastic. I loved hearing all the examples and all the positives that have come out of this challenging time as well. Um, so we have about three minutes left. I'm just going to do one catch all question for all three of you. Um, just because of time is so limited. So um, I loved how Diana, you mentioned that trauma informed is a culture, not a checklist. I'd love to hear each of you your best advice for moving beyond the checklist into a genuine culture, a genuine trauma informed culture. Um, let's start with Laurel. Um, I think that my best advice is to honor context. Um, and to make sure you're, um, you're really informed about the context that your clients are living in. And um, what, are the, what are the challenges they face? What are the resources available in their context? Um, and um, you really honor that. That's great. Um, let's go to Diana. Thank you. Um, I agree with Dr. Kaiser. I think context is a really important thing. The only maybe an additional thought would be um, expecting that to shift as trust builds. Know that who presents and what shows up and how it shows up will shift. As people become more comfortable, they may be more cranky or more authentic in um, frustration or, or sharing genuinely. Um, and that that's a sign of progress uh, and that you're doing a good job with trauma informed. Excellent. Okay. And then let's have Melissa close us out. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think those are both great comments. I think the other thing is like um, supporting staff through it all is very important and um, being understanding with staff that it's going to be um, that sometimes shifting is hard. Uh, it's hard for them as well. And I, Think just understanding and supporting them through it. Totally. Okay, well that was excellent. Um, thank you so much to our three wonderful speakers. This was their third time doing this presentation for the different cohorts, so we really appreciate all of their time and commitment. Um, we um, are going to transition over to our break, and before we do, we have a poll question that we would love to get the everybody's thoughts on. Um, which is going to help inform our discussion later on in the meeting today. So I believe that poll will be coming up in a moment. And this question is, which of these topics would you like to see discussed further during our looking forward session, which is going to be our last um, panel today? Uh, so the options are challenges to providing trauma-informed services in a virtual setting, practical tips for building a trauma-informed virtual workforce, engaging community partners and delivering and improving virtual services, the concept and impacts of earned mistrust in the TANF setting, potential pitfalls and lessons learned from the trauma speakers and respondent panel. And then if you have other that you'd rather talk about uh, than what we've offered here, you can enter any additional thoughts in the chat and we'd love to hear those. So we are now gonna take a 10 minute break uh, we're going to start again with our next panel at the top of the hour at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. And thank you again so much to Laurel, Diana, and Melissa for your wonderful presentations today and information. Thanks, everyone. We'll be right back in 10 minutes. Feel free to stay on Zoom and um, just walk away and come back when you're ready. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, it's the top of the hour. Uh, Steve, I was wondering if we could close the poll. We will circle back to um, the results in that third session, so the one right after this one. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed their break and were able to regroup for our next session. My name is Brianna Carroll, and I'm a manager at ICF, also in the Workforce Innovation and Poverty Solutions Group, which supports the Office of Family Assistance. So the next session today is overcoming barriers to technology and supporting clients in a virtual environment. In the past year, TANF programs have witnessed probably more than ever the importance of accessibility to virtual technology for the success of both their programs and their clients. So today we're gonna to learn about how that accessibility to technology can create additional barriers for the most vulnerable populations and how TANF programs to, can help clients overcome these barriers.
So I'm really excited to introduce our four speakers today. They have tons of great information to share. Um, I just want to go over a couple quick housekeeping items. So the first is I will briefly introduce each of our speakers. However, again, if you want to read that full bio, I encourage you to go to the Bizabo platform to download um, the entire bios. I also want to mention we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations. So please, along the way, submit your questions into the chat box and we will get to them at the end. And then the last thing I want to remind you is that workshop tool handout. Feel free to use it to jot down any um, notes or reflections that you might have as you hear our presenters today. So we have a lot to cover in the next 45 minutes, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today is Anna Reed. She is a research officer for the Pew Charitable Trust Broadband Initiative, which examines efforts to connect millions of Americans to high-speed, reliable internet. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Anna. Thanks so Thanks much, so Alicia. Thanks again for the invitation. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, um, and the next one. So uh, Pew is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization, and we're focused on complex policy challenges. For the last several years, we've been looking at uh, efforts to expand broadband access, particularly at the state level, including who's online and, and who's not. So next slide, please. Um, so, when we're looking at lack of access to broadband, it's a fairly significant challenge. Um, the Federal Communications Commission um, in 2020 estimated that at least 18.3 million Americans lack access to broadband at their current speed definition of 25 megabits per second in the download direction, three megabits per second in the upload direction. And I'll talk a little bit more about those speeds in a minute. Um, this number is widely considered to be an underestimate. Um, Broadband Now, which is an industry uh, watchdog group, places that number as high as 42 million Americans who lack access to broadband at those speeds. Um, there are additional estimates. Uh, Microsoft, which, which measures the speed of data traffic at their, their data centers, um, also uh, places it as high as 162 million. And that's not necessarily that the infrastructure isn't there. It may be that people are subscribing to lower speeds, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty significant challenge and there's a wide range in the estimates of, of how many people lack access. So next slide, please. Um, and I do wanna clarify when I'm talking about access here, it means that the infrastructure is in place so that if a household um, wanted to or was able to subscribe to a connection at those speeds, they would be able to. And so when we're looking at this, this component of the challenge, uh, just over 5% of Americans do not have access to internet at these speeds, but there is a fairly large rural urban divide. So in urban areas, it's fewer than 2% who lack access. Uh, in rural areas, it's more than one in five uh, rural Americans who cannot access broadband or in high speed internet uh, at broadband speeds. Uh, next slide, please. So just to touch briefly on what these speeds mean, again, the FCC currently uh, defines broadband as 25 megabits per second in the download direction, three megabits per second in the upload direction. And um, when you're looking at these standard applications, and this is, um, this is an FCC chart on uh, consumer broadband speed guide, uh, things like distance learning, telecommuting, um, or even like streaming high definition video and um, downloading large files, use higher speeds, they're more intensive applications. And then next slide, please. As you have more users or devices connected to those higher speed applications, you begin to need um, more speed than that 25 megabits per second, three megabits per second. So that's just to contextualize. So that's kind of a, a baseline level of service. And as we've seen throughout the pandemic, it often does not meet uh, needs when you have multiple members of a household or multiple devices accessing those higher bandwidth applications at the same time. Next slide, please. So the next challenge is obviously where there is, um, where infrastructure is available, not everyone is online, not everyone subscribes to a, a connection. Um, so the adoption rates uh, nationally, our, our colleagues at the Pew Research Center have done a lot of work 
on understanding who and who isn't online, uh, as well as why, uh, have found that about three quarters of adults uh, in the US have a home broadband subscription. Um, they've also done some, some look at work looking at the reasons for non-adoption um, and cost really comes up as one of the, the primary uh, that a household would not have a home broadband subscription. So next slide, please. Um, so just looking at who is and who isn't online, um, when you look at age, there are fairly significant gaps uh, between uh, those under 64, where in all of, all of those age groups, more than three quarters of adults are online, um, more than that, that national average. When you look at age of 65 plus, it's fewer than 60%. Um, next slide. There are also gaps in access by uh, race. So non-white households are much uh, are less likely to have a home broadband subscription um, than white households. And you see 79% um, of white households uh, versus 61% of, of Hispanic households. Next slide, please. And then where you see really, uh, really significant gaps is by income. So uh, when you're looking at household or adults with incomes over $75,000 a year, uh, over 90% um, have a home broadband uh, subscription. When you're looking at uh, adults earning less than $30,000 a year, that falls to under 60%. So you see a, a very substantial gap uh, based on income. Next slide, please. And then I just briefly wanted to touch on um, smartphones for broadband access. And smartphones are, are a common way to get on, um, to access the internet. However, um, the Federal Communications Commission, as well as uh, several other organizations, uh, do not consider them to be a functional equivalent for a home broadband subscription for multiple reasons, including uh, data caps, um, the just devices that you're using to access the sort of ease of ease of completing some of the um, some tasks on smartphones versus on another type of device. Uh, so. Um, you do, however, see that non-white and low-income Americans are much more likely to depend on a smartphone uh, for broadband access. And when uh, you're looking at these numbers, they're really kind of the reverse of who has a home broadband subscription. And again, uh, we see a very, very large gap associated with income um, when you're looking at households earning over 75, uh, or adults earning over $75,000 a year. Um, only 6% are mobile dependent, where when you're looking at um, households earning under $30,000 a year, over a quarter are, uh, over one in four are smartphone dependent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then just to highlight some of the impacts uh, of the pandemic in the last year, school closures really highlighted uh, the digital divide uh, estimates. Um, from Common Sense Media and Boston Consulting Group earlier in the, the in 2020 estimated that between 15 and 16 million students lack either the internet connection, um, the device that they need to access the internet, or both to be able to meaningfully engage in online education. And then additionally, um, 300 to 400,000 teachers lack access to um, an internet connection that will enable teaching from home. That's about 10% of teachers nationwide. Um, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we really focused on the work of state broadband programs and wanted to highlight that they do provide a number of resources on connecting with um, low cost or affordable offers as well as public access points uh, for, for broadband. Uh, so with that, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Brianna. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think seeing those national stats um, in this context is really helpful, especially what people are seeing on the ground and in the field. So I really appreciate it. Um, we will go ahead and jump right over to our next speaker, Charles Thompson. Charlie is the Associate Dean um, for Workforce Funding at Edmonds College and currently oversees the Work First TANF and SNAP programs. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Charlie. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of the things that we've learned. We've been working on this uh, particular subject for the last 10 years um, with a program we've got with the 
the Office of Family Assistance. Uh, next slide, please. What we want to talk about is really one simple message today, that loaning a computer to the family is not enough. Uh, we know that education is the number one thing that lifts people out of poverty, but especially these days, there's lots of barriers for, for folks who have been struggling financially and have been receiving assistance to be able to make that transition. Um, so the internet connectivity, as we just heard, is extremely important. And also having in-house internet access um, really should be viewed now as a utility and not because you really can't function very well in, in life without uh, the internet. Everything from baking and shopping and, and doing everything. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> as I said, we've been at this for a little over 10 years or about 10 years now uh, with the work uh, of the Health Professions Opportunity Grant with the uh, Office of Family Assistance. And we've been a really strong uh, partner in this, this organization and this time. And we have always felt from the beginning that we needed to have this kind of access uh, to overcome many of the barriers that our folks in poverty um, have faced. Next, please. So we really have four elements um, that we work together that make our program work so well. One is, of course, a laptop. We're going to loan them a laptop. We want them to take care of it. We want to be able to replace it or support it any way we can. Uh, one of the, the key things that we found we could do was to offer uh, the student to earn that laptop if they completed uh, their, their healthcare program or got a job uh, and, and started to improve things. Um, that little thing, that little bit really helped build our trust uh, that we would hand them on the first day a $700 laptop and an internet connection. Um, and it really helped uh, really set the stage for us. Um, the second thing, of course, is the broadband access. Uh, what we found uh, best wasn't to pay for uh, someone's uh, wired connection, but to go with a mobile hotspot. Uh, with a state contract, we were able to get them for about $40 a month uh, for unlimited data, and they could take it anywhere. And with a lot of our single moms, which was the majority of our, our uh, folks working, um, it saved them a lot of time, um, and they could do their homework from anywhere. So they could take their child to uh, after school activities and sit there in the bleacher and work on their homework. Next, please. The third one is really important too, and that's to make sure that the family has training and knows how to use the silly machine. Um, we have a, we've had a broad uh, a broad group of, of folks that have participated in our program, everywhere from immigrants who really need help even learning to speak English um, and older folks who haven't really wanted to work for a with a computer for a really long time. And so really we have courses um, from keyboarding to, to whatever skills that our instructors help us uh, make sure that students have before they come into class and also a one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And the main message was to meet them where they are and to bring them up to a, a a, a level that they can really work well, especially in healthcare, because computers are such a key element for that. And then the final piece is the community building and with administrative oversight. We had ability to make a machine a brick if if that was needed, if it was stolen. Uh, we replaced it if they filed a, a police report, um, but we, we actually are able then to turn it off. Uh, we can monitor that they aren't uh, going to uh, inappropriate websites and and that really big that accountability of taking care of it was really important um, in comparison with our, our co-workers who through the library would give out uh, Chromebooks and had to replace about 40% of them every quarter. Um, we had very little replacement over the time because the students really took personal pride in it. Next please. Mm -hmm. The impact, 
was tremendous, not only for, for our graduates, but also for their families. Um, I'm not going to read all these quotes to you, but the middle one is one of my favorites. It enabled me to participate when needed and when I could. As I worked while attending school and I'm a single parent, had I not received a computer with internet service, I would not have been able to participate in this life-changing opportunity. Thank you. Receiving the new laptop was a defining moment in my life. I'm so grateful to have this powerful tool and resource. It helped overcome so many of the barriers <clears throat> that our students faced in, in trying to come back to school and, and, and work. Uh, next slide, please. About three years in, we did a really quick unscientific poll. Uh, and so, but we found out some very key elements uh, with that. Of course, you know that students, their kids usually help them the most um, in getting things used to it. Uh, but we found that 47% did not have any computer or reliable internet in their home uh, before we started. 41% used it daily then to research employment opportunities <clears throat> for them and their family. 76% um, used it daily to complete their school assignments. 41 used it daily to communicate with staff and faculty and even 12% used it to communicate with one of our other 50 uh, social partners in our, our healthcare program. And the biggest thing we kept hearing over and over again is how much important it was for their children. Uh, if they see mom or dad at the kitchen table working their homework on the computer, they were that much more interested in completing theirs. And it's only become stronger in all of this during this, this terrible time over the last year. Next, please. Ah, wow, I'm faster than I thought. Um, yeah, to conclude, I mean, really, it is just that one message is just handing out computers and even just connecting them up to the, to the internet through their, their cable provider just isn't enough. Um, those in our early program that we did that kind of thing, they dropped out really quickly and were frustrated in so many different ways. So if I can answer any questions, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. I also um, was was watching the clock and you finished so quickly, but I really appreciate you sharing your programs and concrete steps and outcomes. I think that's really valuable to people. And so we really appreciate your time. Um, again, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, feel free to use the chat box. Um, I will now hand it over to our third speaker, Daywan Wade Jones. Daywan is a supervisor of special projects for operations and training for the DC Department of Human Services. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Daywan. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Uh, Again, you know, Brianna's did a great job with introductions and just keeping us moving along. I'd like to speak to you guys about the PUSH initiative in the district and what we're doing to keep our families connected and making sure that they have what they need uh, during, you know, uh, our past year and what we're continuing to do from the lessons learned and the questions that we're still asking. Uh, could we please go to the next slide? So what we're looking to solve are really just three uh, core components here. That's really to mitigate the digital divide and help customers access technology, leverage uh, the technology, and how best to support uh, our families, our systems, and our processes, and of course to keep customers engaged remotely. Um, we, we know we have families who are constantly asking questions about how they can uh, continue to keep uh, engaged with what it is that they're doing. They're looking for ways to remain motivated and we want to make sure that we're in uh, the best position possible to provide the resources and tools wherever we can uh, in our capacity. If we could go to the next slide, please. So we, last summer, a DHS launched the 2Gen um, incentive model. Uh, and what we did because uh, the district has pushed out its two-gen approach, we started looking at ways of incentivizing monetarily some of the activities that our families are engaged in on the day-to-day -day basis around supporting uh, 
uh, the, the members and their family, whether that was scheduling virtual uh, or scheduling appointments, opening savings accounts, making sure they were able to secure housing, uh, working with their children in the home, of course, through virtual learning, and a number of other activities uh, that we looked at within each core component of 2Gen. Uh, but this also started to highlight to us through a number of assessments, conversations, and, and coaching was where our families uh, gaps were and where we could really strengthen those gaps. Uh, and one of the things we noticed was not just the, the access to technology, but the need for more education and opportunities. So uh, could we go to the next slide, please? We started looking at ways that we could motivate customers and engage with them. Uh, we started looking at ways to recruit uh, customers who were unengaged. We realized that last year we ran into a bit of a rough patch with making sure uh, those who were unengaged uh, had an opportunity and a clear path to really reconnect with the agency. Uh, and also, last but not least, it's just to make sure that our customers who were facing economic instabilities had the opportunity to make sure that they felt that, that dual-pronged approach where we were not giving up on them as far as making sure that they had what they need to be reconnected uh, with employment opportunities wherever available within uh, whatever career pathway they chose, but they also had the ability to secure um, economic stability. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that they were paired with the appropriate resources to do so, whether that was internal within our agency or external. Um, and of course, for our uh, engaged customers, we want to make sure that they don't lose momentum or they don't lose motivation for what it is that they were doing. So it was really a family by family approach to see where the needs were and what uh, what our approach would be moving forward. Could we go to the next slide? So I'd like to talk now about what the push initiative did and it really just beefed up what we were uh, starting to do. But of course, in this, we learned a lot of lessons and it really goes back to both programs. So I'm fortunate to be in a space where I'm working with both our TANF customers and our SNAP ENT uh, customers as well, uh, well, our programs, both of our, our TANF programs and our SNAP employment and training programs as well. Uh, and so with our, ta uh, our TANF customers, we're working through our employment program to um, to get computers for them with their discretionary work related expenses and so this is a, a set of funds for them when customers are engaged in education or employment this provides them the opportunity to use these funds to purchase laptops uh, and we've created a partnership um, and to purchase these laptops so that we would uh, kind of create this pathway for our customers to have access to them uh, during the pandemic. And so we've kind of partnered not just for the laptop, but also for the free internet service as well, and the computer skills training. So in this, the, the conversation has really led us to really see a, a, a really uh, explosive number in uh, requests for the laptops and the internet service with uh, the internet essentials. Um, happening in the district with our TANF customers. Can we go to the next slide, please? With our SNAP employment and training program, this one was a little bit different. So we're not necessarily purchasing the laptops for the customers engaged in the SNAP program. This one is a loaner program. So our SNAP employment and training has partnered with Biteback and they're loaning out the laptops in four month windows for customers. And they have the opportunity to extend that, um, that window if necessary or if needed. They are armed also with technical support if they do need it. And they're able to reach out um, for, whatever, uh, uh, for whatever needs <laughs> need to be met during that time, excuse me. And so 150 um, laptops over that time uh, are kind of in this uh, space to be used with our SNAP employment and training program. And so we have a number of things that are happening um, within both of these programs at the same time. We are keeping an eye on the needs of the family, not just 
the, the technology needs, but how the families are growing and what opportunities are coming down the pipe. So we're taking a look at those employment opportunities, how education is changing in the home and how they're accessing it. We're looking at the opportunities um, that are kind of changing how they're looking uh, at technology. What is that going to mean for us in the next six to 12 months? Uh, and we're seeing a lot of our families kind of start the start to open the conversation um, around uh, technology needing to be more prominent for them uh, and what that could mean for them moving forward. Uh, it's, it, COVID has really started to change the way we look at employment. So it's really been uh, an integral way for us to uh, create a, a space and a platform for our customers. If you could go to the next slide. So just to speak a little bit about the free internet service, uh, we did partner with Comcast and they have the internet essentials. And so it provides, uh, depending on the, and a lot of the requirements are on their website. So it allows families to receive free internet service depending upon what public benefit, or I believe it, it's if they're receiving public benefits, uh, they can sign up and receive the uh, modem for their home or it'll be delivered uh, for them and their families. Uh, and they're able to uh, collect, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not collect, but receive uh, free internet service uh, from there. And so we also worked with our Office of Chief Technology Officer uh, to acquire the uh, laptops and figure out what the best course of action would be. So from there, I'd like to wrap up and just say thank you, and I appreciate it so much. There may be a couple other slides, but really to wrap it up, I think that's that's really, I, I did cover a lot of the information there. No, thank you so much, Daywan. And um, this PowerPoint is available. Um, I know it was attached at the beginning, but I think it's also on the platform. So um, thank you so much for sharing so much about your programs and in different ways that you're keeping people motivated and engaged. So we'll go to our final speaker and then go into a short Q&A. So our final speaker today is Michael Yoder, who is the Workforce Development Manager for the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services in Nevada. So Mike, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, I'm in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, this first slide is the intro, slide two is simply contact information. And so slide three gets right into my presentation. And so to uh, begin profiling the efforts that we've made in helping our population overcome barriers to uh, technology, I'd like to first talk about the foundational concepts that led us to the type of support that we've been providing. Uh, so being the workforce development uh, unit manager statewide, uh, when the lockdown began in March of 2020, we decided that the obvious course of action would be to engage our local schools to learn about virtual training programs uh, that were available for in-demand occupations uh, so that our TANF uh, clients and our SNAP clients could be considered as a viable workforce pool. Our uh, business approach for employer engagement uh, within the integrated workforce system that we have in our relatively small community is done in a partnered way. So we don't do it independently. We usually team up with other partners. Uh, so we immediately got together with the local schools and Title I partners to team up. Uh, so you have the schools who create the programs that have the components to serve the needs of the local employers and then we have our Title I partners to share the cost of tuition, who also have relationships with employers and the schools. So what do we bring to the table? A well-vetted and prepared workforce pool from our TANF program through vocational uh, personality assessments, academic and soft skill assessments, uh, and a funding stream that helps stretch out our Title I partners, uh, WIOA funding capabilities. So that's how we sell our value to the workforce partnership in our community. Um, what we look for is proof of concept um, uh, in a distance learning partner. Uh, proof of concept uh, includes uh, transparency in their employer relations. Uh, we, should, we should know who's at the table. What's the job attainment rate for this particular employer? 
that you're selling this class to us on um, what the average starting wage is, upward mobility, and some communication with those employers on a partnered basis. Um, so we're able to pay up to $7,500 tuition plus supportive services. Uh, Title I sometimes uh, here can't pay for equipment, fees, or supplies. So we're able to uh, pick up some of those supportive services, which brings an added value uh, to the table. And that's for the TANF program. Our SNAP program has a little more limitations on how much supportive services they're able to cover. So moving on to slide four. Um, so now that uh, we have the plan in place for distance learning, we needed to ensure that every candidate had a working laptop or computer. Uh, and I mean a working computer that could function properly and efficiently through to the end of a course, because we've had some folks in the past who had issues with the functionality of what they had at home. So we, we vet each individual to make sure they, they have something that's working all the way through. Uh, I wanted to get a standard build for our customers, so I reached out to one of our partnered schools to speak with an IT professional at the school to find out what the minimum computer specs should be uh, to successfully nav navigate through a distance learning course. And we found a fantastic vendor who had worked with some local so social service agencies before, and they were able to put together a $450 Dell or Lenovo refurbished laptop. They put brand new uh, motherboards and processors in there. And this is a list of the components that are required for efficient um, uh, use in a distance learning course. You, you need the camera, the speakers, the microphone in order to uh, communicate with instructors and participate in group exercises, um, such as what we're doing right now. <laughs> and uh, the internet service, uh, been a lot of talk about that and not to repeat anything, but a long time barrier for participants, we also agree has been affordable internet connection, uh, not just since the pandemic, but with the majority of job applications being online for the past 10 years, uh, access to the web, we agree also has become a necessity and is no longer a luxury for our clients. Uh, it's not an efficient use of time when in crisis situation to pack up the kids, get on a bus, travel to a daycare center, then a library simply to access the internet in order to perform a, a job search, uh, to work on your resume or do em, uh, employment or education research. Some participants based on the geography of their community have spent up to four hours on the bus and less than half of that time actually getting anything accomplished. So we recently instituted a policy to allow for reimbursement of up to $55 per month for monthly charges and a maximum of $100 lifetime for a one-time setup uh, or installation fee for establishing internet service for our clients. Uh, for cost effectiveness and extended savings for the client, we also uh, direct the participant to contact one of several internet providers who offer discounts to low-income individuals such as AT&T, Comcast, Cox, uh, we found that they all have around $10 uh, monthly charge for folks who can show that they're low income. So we uh, point them in that direction uh, in order to stretch that dollar out. And before we adopted this into policy, we also paid for hotspot rentals uh, for a three month course with CSN. Uh, and we reserve that option to do that in cases where the internet service for service for some reason isn't a viable option for the participants, such as the case where past due billing issues are uh, involved or they're not on the lease at that address um, or areas where the service is not ava uh, that available. Um, moving on to slide five. Um, wanted to show a, an example of some of the distance learning collaborations that we've uh, done so far uh, since the shutdown. College of Southern Nevada and our Title I partner um, with the Workforce Investment Board um, reached out to some employers and there was a need for dialysis tech and community health worker. Um, so our Title I partner does the vetting in a lot of cases when we have them on board, they do a really good uh, assessment process uh, and there, they have this, uh, CSN has a program called ACES Adult Career and Education Service where the school actually co-manages this case for us. Uh, it's their workforce and economic development uh, department. Uh, it's something non-traditional uh, that schools don't all have, but they help us make sure that the client is moving along successfully through the program. 
Uh, we just started an HVAC on um, in early March for 11 students uh, with employers at the table. Uh, and we have a, several schools that are teaching web developer, IT works, entry level IT careers. Uh, moving on to slide six. Um, some of the other things that our agency has done also to help with these barriers, um, not just in the way of vocational training, but um, for example, phone picture verifications for clients that need to turn in uh, timesheets or verifications for programs. Uh, we're allowing them to take pictures of verifications and send them on their phone to their case manager. We're using e-signatures, a computer program called Sarah, where the client can email or text their case manager directly and vice versa. And we can send out promotional material via this program, Sarah. And for the two generation approach, um, DWSS has also recognized the uh, virtual support that we provide may also serve a two generation approach to TANF family assistance in recent conversations with the Clark County libraries in the area and other workforce partners. Uh, we've agreed to help lead our participants to early childhood education sites and our software so that school age children may benefit from these educational resources and get those on the laptop so that the whole family can use it. Clients get to keep their laptop. Uh, we justify the expenditure for the activity that they're in while on the TANF program to maintain uh, cooperation for receiving those benefits. So um, if anybody has any questions, that wraps up my presentation and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I did see that one question came in. So day one, I believe this came up during your presentation. If you can unmute and talk a little bit more about um, the free internet service and how your agency is currently paying for it. Sorry about that. Uh, so the internet essentials is something that, well, I can't, hold on one second. Second, there's a couple things happening in my background. Hold on. I apologize for that. So, how it's being paid for? I'm I can't, I'm not sure of too many of the nuances uh, for it being free. I know the low the low cost of it. Um, is something that we do partner with a lot of our families to make sure it's something they are able to do. We have constantly been in partnership. Um, of course, I think like I shared with our Office of Chief Technology Officer uh, at the district here to make sure that it's really been a smooth transition to make sure that we've been able to acquire enough laptops uh, and to make sure that our partnerships for internet access is something that our families are able to engage and get connected with. Um, if that's something I could most definitely uh, get the information to, uh, get, the, get the information and then, and then share back, that's something I could most definitely do. Um, I, I most definitely can share that information. Uh, for our SNAP ENT, and just to share, I know um, we do have tech support for our Snappy and T customers, that's being done through uh, Bite Back, which is a, a program here um, in the district, and they they house classes for credentialing with the A plus with uh, networking. They have a lot. They're uh, a vocational education and trade uh, program here. So not only are they distributing. Uh, the laptops, but they are helping with a number of other uh, things as well with our SNAP implement and training um, program here as well. So they're providing a lot of technical assistance where they can with, uh, with our families. Um, but when it comes to Comcast, a lot of it is done directly through them. And then I believe we do have uh, a number and point of contact for our families to reach out to them and to receive whatever services and support it is that they need to make sure that they're able to utilize any of the, um, the pieces of technology that they're receiving um, from them directly. 
Thank you so much, Jaywan. And Charlie, I see a question for you. Before I hop over to you, Mike, I know um, your program also has some partnerships um, with internet services. Is there anything you would like to add specifically that you guys have done? Uh, yeah, I like if I was gonna answer the one question who provides the technical support for clients utilizing the hotspots for the first time, our uh, school partner, we rented the hotspots for our first cohort with uh, College of Southern Nevada and their IT department uh, handled all that for us. Um, other than that, um, you know, somebody asked in one of the sessions um, if we partnered with the Comcast or Cox or any of those and we don't part, we've tried, we've reached out to try and see if we could form a partnership. But we just did the research to find the, the low income uh, deals that some of these inter internet companies have. And then we instituted the policy of reimbursing them for the entire cost of the internet service and try to get them down to the lowest bill that they can get uh, through just providing that information. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Charlie, um, I will go ahead and um, ask a question from Mike for you. Who provides the technical support for clients utilizing hotspots for the first time? Well, to, um, to be honest, we tried two or three different models uh, as we went through the, the program and the most successful was our final one, which was to hire uh, a digital navigator. And our whole uh, health Professions Opportunity Grant Program was really built around uh, a supportive team. Um, and we'd have community navigator, we had academic navigator, and we had a digital navigator. Uh, luckily, we found a gentleman who could teach and patiently tutor, and at the same time, he loved replacing a keyboard um, or on a laptop, that kind of thing. And, and he was wonderful um, and, and he still is with the program now. Um, yeah, that's, that's been most of it that and we buy really good equipment to begin with. So um, that really helped a lot. Thanks. Thank you. So we have uh, two minutes before our break. So if just in a, a couple of sentences, um, if you all, uh, Anna, we'll start with you if that's okay. So as folks continue to do um, more both in volume and complexity, what is one piece of advice that you can give to ensure equitable access for program offerings? Um. So as we're looking at investment infrastructure, focusing on those higher speeds that will meet the sort of uh, not just current usage standard, more intensive applications for more purposes um, into the future. Uh, so yeah, focusing investment um, on those higher speed standards and then also not just on um, rural areas that completely lack access now, but also ensuring that we're focusing on, you know, upgrading infrastructure in urban and suburban areas that have access on the lower end of what is currently um, qualifies as broadband. Thank you, Anna. Charlie, what about you? I'm sorry, could you ask the question again? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Um, if, um, if, you, if you could just give one piece of advice um, to try to ensure equitable access to program offerings. What could you ask I, uh, I, folks to do more of? Well, I, I think having the broadband access and the computer, it was one of the things that really helps uh, our students, no matter what background or 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 whatever their experience has been, um, it was a common thread uh, in order to be able to help bring them on and and have them believe in themselves and just keep working with it. But uh, yeah, about the best I could say. Thank you, day one. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm having a bit of audio issues on my end. 
Yeah, no worries. And then if you and Mike um, can just go back to back so we can um, launch our poll. But um, just if you had one piece of advice that you could give um, as you navigate the more volume and complexity of uh, equitable access to program offerings, what's one piece of advice you would give programs? Continue, continue to be, to be open, open to ideas, to ideas. Uh, and, and I would just, I would just really just say just keep an open, open line of communication, communication with staff. With staff. Uh, that's really been uh, the most valuable piece of information. Uh, really leveraging who we have on our teams has been valuable. You learn that there's quite a few members on your uh, team that have skills that, you know, we may not know that they have. That's something that, you know, I'd lean into or resources that, you know, we may not have tapped into. Uh, locally that, you know, other people may be aware of. And uh, you said back to back, right? Uh, I assume uh, it's my turn. So we, uh, looking at the uh, equitable factor, we've worked with the uh, state senator, and certainly we could do this on our own as well, but there's an assembly bill here, Assembly Bill 354 in Nevada, that addresses the disproportionately higher unemployment rates among African Americans aged 16 to 24. So what I've done is I have ordered an ad hoc report for all the zip codes that have the disproportionately higher unemployment rates. And we make sure to get the training opportunities and these resources and opportunities to those underserved individuals in the specific zip codes to ensure uh, equitable service by our program. Thank you so much. Um, I know we are two minutes over, so I really want to thank everyone so, so much um, for um, all of your information today. And I know it was a lot in a short amount of time. So we'll give you um, a little bit of time for a break for some reflections and notes and um, return for a third session um, to address some of the areas that you'd like to hear a little bit more of. So before you um, get a sip of water um, and get up, if you could quickly answer our next poll question, which will help shape the conversation for our last session. Um, it's up here on the board. So which of these topics would you like to see discussed in the looking forward session, which is the one, um, our last session? Um, so you can see all the options there. And then um, if you select other, something that is not listed here, um, please then uh, specify in the chat box. So thank you so much. And we'll return at the top of the hour. Any idea? Welcome everybody. I, I think I should start over. We're, we ha I had some uh, glitches here. My name is Joe Raymond. Um, I'm gonna moderate the session this afternoon. Um, I am the uh, Director of Social Policy and Human Services Programs at ICF. Get to work on a variety of federal and state initiatives. Um, uh, we're going to try to identify as many practical and specific actionable strategies we can today around the many topics around virtual casework and trauma-informed practices we can this afternoon. We want you to submit any questions or any ideas for discussion through the chat feature, and we will definitely try to get to those. Um, two experts are with us today to help us get started, Anna T. Kipp and Jerry Cotter. Um, their full bios are uh, in the materials you have access to. Additionally, the rest of this, many of the rest of the speakers uh, should feel free to weigh in on the questions and the discussion as they go forward. Um, so we'll look forward to doing that. Anna is a clinician at the Center for Work Education and Employment in Denver. Um, she also thinks deeply about organizational capacity and kind of looks at the entire picture as she thinks about how to create a culture of um, trauma informed practice in an organization. Jerry is the project director uh, for the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program for the Workforce Agency in Ohio. Uh, so these are really excellent people to have a, 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 a detailed conversation with. Um, and so I think we just like to get started by having both of them uh, kind of hit the highlights of what they heard this afternoon, earlier this afternoon, and we'll build on that conversation. Again, please submit any questions you have or ideas as we move forward. This will take, we'll have about 40, 45 minutes to do this. So uh, Anna, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, 
Thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this kind of a conversation to have pull in the threads of what we've heard so far and really think together about what's next. Um, and to start by just naming how hard it can be to start thinking about looking forward when we're still in this moment of disruption and disquiet. And I think um, really as we start to maybe experience some sense of optimism and some hope of moving from a crisis towards looking forward, that it can be actually more unsettling time. There's still so much that remains unknown and unpredictable. Um, so we hold that as we start thinking about really concrete strategies um, to still you know, what we can pull from this past year um, in our experience using that trauma-informed lens to start strategizing for next steps. Um, and I think our, our first panel started, off, started us off so well thinking about the impact of trauma. You know, we really think about broadly our goals of you know, increased economic mobility, sustained employment. We think about the core role of a relationship, um, relationship of, of ourselves with our participants, with our staff members, with each other, with our participants, our program participants in, in the program, but with future employers, with their family, with their children's schools. The relationship is at the core of all of this. And we heard really um, deeply this morning about the impact of trauma on relationship. We know it disrupts relationship. Uh, and then we map onto that the disruption of the last year in the culminating fatigue that many of us are experiencing, right? We're experiencing it organizationally, uh, our service providers are experiencing it, and those we serve are really experiencing the fatigue of the worry, the stress, the grief and loss of the last year, and also this adaption fatigue, right? So this moment of disruption, the moment of crisis caused us to innovate, to do things differently, to do things quickly, um, and that was both this opportunity and it probably has some real impact in our sense of where our energy lies moving forward and how to think about that. So there's this parallel I like to draw when I think about being a clinician working with survivors of trauma, moving from that survivorship towards healing and making meaning of the experience. We can think about how an organization goes through that process too. How do we move from adaptation to integration? How do we make meaning um, to support our work going forward. And what are the different areas we wanna think about that with? So I really think about wanting to really remember the importance of the pause and the reflection. What has worked well in the last year? What have we done that worked well? How do we know? And very importantly, who are we asking? How do we gather that information? How do we build towards a mutual resilience? So, so often we, we hear the word resilience a lot in connection with trauma. Um, and I really challenge us all to really think about what does resilience look like in a mutual um, environment? We think about the way in which this last year has created some universalizing of this experience of the trauma. And how do we use that environment and that landscape to build together? So it's not about an individual's skill set, an individual's resources, or about, you know, really challenging us not to think about how do we adapt to harm and oppression, but how do we work together to increase our shared skill building um, and use shared experience in the trauma-informed framework to move towards a mutual resilience? And then how do we aim and create a sustained cadence for the work? As we move from crisis, which can feel so energizing and invigorating in many ways, and we now move into thinking about reflection and integration, how do we create some sustainability around what the work looks like? And, you know, hoping that in this next 45 minutes, we can really talk about some really concrete strategies for that piece. How do we hold on to some of the gains of increased access, um, both through use of technology and internet, but through remote work and scheduling? How do we create, you know, maintain some of the gains while also reinstituting some of the boundaries and kind of work styles that also protect our staff and our participants to be able to continue to do the work in meaningful ways. That's really excellent. Thank you, Anna. There's a lot there, I think, to uh, try to come back to and talk about in some really specific terms for both staff and our goals and our the resilience you spoke of and the relationship. I'm very curious about how to maintain that with our with our customers. Um, Jerry, what what left out at you that you'd like to highlight right now? <laughs> Um, I would like to 
echo what Anna said. I, I do think relationships really are key. Um, you know, whether you're talking about relationships between uh, case manager, career coaches, um, between leadership and staff, um, those, those, those are really important, especially in, um, I mean, I think they're always important for outcomes, um, you know, and, and particularly for participants to have supportive relationships uh, to be able to build upon. I think that will really help with their outcomes, but especially now during the pandemic when everybody feels so isolated, um, whether, you know, where we're talking about participants, staff, managers, I think everybody's struggling quite a bit um, with all the changes. Um, that's another thing that uh, Anna mentioned. Just so much change, so, not, so much adaptation um, has really been, I think, wearing on, on everybody. You know, again, participant level, staff, leadership. Um, it, it does feel like quite the marathon um, event. I also think that uh, with trauma-informed care, um, again, that relationship is really key, um, making sure that um, we are, you know, trying to be supportive of both staff and participants and their individual situations is really important. Um, everybody's had uh, quite a number of uh, disruptions to their daily routines. Um, they may, you know, be struggling with things like loss of um, income. Um, maybe they have kids still at home trying to learn um, virtually and trying to work at the same time if we're talking about staff. Um, but even with participants, just trying to, you know, participate in the program is hard if you have kids at home or others maybe that are ill that you're caring for. So there's increased um, family stressors on both staff and participants with, you know, things like online school. Um, so much more time together, <laughs> which is a good and bad thing sometimes, right? Um, the isolation, I think that, you know, a lot of families are dealing with increased abusive situations. Um, so those are important things to consider. Um, and when we're dealing with, you know, trying to work with people virtually, um, you, know, you just have to think about each individual's family situation um, and, and try and take that into account as you schedule appointments, you know, is privacy an issue? Um, are they not able to really focus on the appointment because they have kids at home? Um, so many different things to think about. Um, it also makes it a little bit more challenging to provide, you know, things like supportive services or other types of services um, to the folks we're working with. Um, I think everybody's dealing with this lack of control, a feeling of a lack of control and just, um, you know, struggling to feel like they might um, have some control over what's going on in their lives. So I think if we can give like participants choices and, and help them, you know, feel a little bit more empowered in that way um, by um, maybe, you know, using a more of a, a coaching model and, and working with them um, virtually, I think that can help. Um, I think training for staff and, and support for staff um, in, in how to work with folks, both virtually and uh, with a trauma-informed mindset is really important. Um, I think also, um, you know, supporting staff to like set aside time for themselves to do self-care. I think especially in this type of environment where there's just so much strange so much change, so much stress on everyone. Um, it's important for staff to set aside time for themselves um, so that they can hopefully avoid compassion fatigue um, and, and recharge their batteries as they work with folks. Um, I think that's also important. And I think, you know, making sure that, you know, leadership is clear and direct with staff, staff are clear and direct with participants. Um, everyone's non-judgmental. I, I think we have to, you know, give a little bit of leeway to everyone in this situation. Um, again, they all have different situations they're dealing with at home. So, so being a little bit more flexible with folks, I think is important. Um, and uh, I think that there are pluses and minuses to like virtual case management. Um, hopefully the flexibility, those types of things we can continue, you know, forward. Uh, once we're allowed to meet in person again. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I, I do think that there's an opportunity uh, to take advantage of some of the flexibility and conveniences offered by virtual case management techniques. Um, but hopefully being able to combine those with in-person 
uh, type connections in the future because it is hard to make that personal connection when you're doing things virtually. So. So that's a that's fantastic. That's that's there's a lot there. So I'm I'm sitting here trying to think about where organizations or states might be on this journey towards trauma informed practice. And and one of the things that was talked about was organizational mistrust. And I'm thinking about the customers we serve. I'm thinking about the staff in our organizations throughout the organizations, and I'm thinking about community partners. Does anyone want to tackle either Jerry or Anna or Daywan how you actually get started? Do you think of this as a collective initiative? How do you, I think we can all envision a training, but it, it seems to me this is way beyond a single training. How do we actually begin to wrestle with this to build this capacity? Good so question. I think that. <laughs> That is a tough question. Um, I, I think that it, it's, it starts out with, you know, trying to make sort of cultural change. Um, and, and then also, it, you know, and that's internally within an organization and with its, you know, um, local um, partner organizations, um, as well as, you know, with consistent messaging and follow through with, uh, with, you know, the people we serve. Um, I think that using uh, human-centered design approaches can really help um, is, you know, if we look at our programs and um, look at ways that we can be more supportive, um, you know, and more empowering towards the people that we're serving, I think that can help. Um, but I do think it, it does really, again, come back to relationships, right? So if you're, if you're using these different methodologies that will establish a more trusted relationship, I think that's really the key um, to establishing better trust for your organization within the community and, and the services that you're providing. Yeah, I would really echo what Jerry's saying about the culture change. And I think, Joe, you were alluding this, to this too, right? That if we're having a trauma-informed approach, it needs to happen, at, it needs to um, be invested in and experienced at every level of the organization. Um, I know we had the, the dentist office example from this morning, but it's true, when you come off the elevator, what does that look like? Who's involved in that experience? When someone answers the phone, what does that feel like? Who's involved in that experience? When staff ask for time off, what does that feel like? Who's involved in that experience? And really thinking about all those different levels. We have a real opportunity here because the first step is buy-in, right? Why are we talking about trauma? What does that look like? Yes. And we have now very rich and overwhelming information about the impact of trauma. And we have this shared traumatic experience writ large of a global pandemic. And so we can think about, we have a lot of information about what the impact would look like. In, and this is not to erase, I know it's a lot, we really need to hold on to that idea of context erasure. All of the things around surviving poverty and other forms of systemic oppression still exist, right? With experience of the pandemic mapped onto that for the people that we're serving and for our staff and organizations. But we have this opportunity of this shared acute experience to I think increase some of that buy-in and, and really introduce some of the language of trauma and the traumatic impact of poverty, um, the impact on organizations and really doing some really, again with the relationship, but building that buy-in piece there. And then I think if we connect that, you know, Joe, you talked about the, the mistrust. I think that mistrust is, happens in different places, right? It can happen within the organization. We think about the hierarchical pieces of the organization and where mistrust can lie there. And we think about people we serve and what that their experience of seeking help has been through either our organization or similar systems. And how do we start to build a reparative experience of help seeking? How, what can that look like for our customers and what can that look like for our staff and for our colleagues? Um, and really thinking about naming where harm may have happened before, right? If we just, if we don't name that we can't heal from it or repair that piece. So how do we know? I think that's, a, to me, it's like an even earlier question. How do we know if there is mistrust and where it stems and from where it stems? And then we can gather that information. How do we name it so that we can move through it um, through, through accountability and relationship building? That's great. Um... We have a question from a participant, but I want to see if there's anyone else first wants to weigh in on this 
big picture. Um, I think the why you guys just discussed, the, the staff that I used to work with were so busy, they would demand, and rightfully so, to understand how will this make things better? And the answer, there's so many good answers to that now. In the old, old days, in which I absolutely was a part of, our staff talked about the relationship they had with their families. They literally called them their families because they were trying to think about how they could be very helpful. Over the years, that was harder and harder to do for many reasons, which folks in the audience know better than, 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 than anyone. Um, anyone else, any other, other speakers want to weigh in how we begin this journey? And then I'll come back to this very specific question about uh, what someone would like us to discuss. They want, if you got a thought, I know you do. <laughs> I do. Uh, I do. So I, I think, you know, first I'd like to start off by saying, and, and this is just me and, the, and my analytical brain, is you do a SWOT, really. And, and that's really looking at where the strengths are, you, because you don't want to lose momentum in that space. But then you also identify the weaknesses, your opportunities, and then your threats. And, and I think to echo both Jerry and Anna, you really do want to look at it at every level because and and i know we've all done it right we're starting to reflect on what has taken place over the past year or so and we're starting to say okay well we're not going back to where we were we're now looking forward uh and so to do so you really have to be raw with where we were um and, and that can be uncomfortable but what that has really done is force you force us all to now say we were vulnerable and is this really what our families have been going through? And if this is what they're going through, and, and I've gone through it for a year with, you know, trying to figure out how to budget my money, how to make sure that there's going to be a larger budget for food because my children are home. I'm going to have to figure out how to, uh, you know, change the way learning is done or to make sure that there's a good support in the home or that I'm well versed in what my kids are learning in math because things have changed since we were in school to now where our kids are in school. So, you know, our families do that on the daily basis while they're also trying to make sure that there's opportunities for them to grow. I think, you know, we've been made vulnerable to now look at our families with the these new set of eyes that we have to say, I now get it. And I think we go back to that SWAT and you say, okay, these are our weaknesses and these are our threats. Where do we begin to bridge those spaces and where does it make most sense to look at how our programs are built out and our trainings so that we can really have the conversations we need to have. And they really will be uncomfortable, but I think they're needed. Um, and it most definitely can be done. Um, I think the right people need to be at the table. I think they need to look exactly like our families look, the ones that we serve. I think we have to make sure that we're intentional about who's at the table and how those conversations are had. And if we begin there, um, cultural change is not difficult uh, moving forward. We just have to make sure that it's done. Um, even so much so sitting at tables where you know, I look like I do, and it's rare. It's 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 intentional. We have to get there and be okay with having those conversations. So it's it's a great thing to see. So clearly, leadership has to buy into this direction. If this is an yeah. orga organizational effort, I have I have a, a, perhaps an obvious question. We're talking about, and you just were articulate about how to think about analyzing how programs work, and we can train people to do things, understand things, and do things differently for customers. They want, can you have a trauma, anyone, a trauma-informed organization that treats customers differently without, what are the implications for how managers and supervisors treat staff and communicate with staff? Can you have one without the other? You can't. You can't. Um, and and I, I love how you frame the question, Joe, because uh, we've been talking about it for quite some time. I think, you know, as we've been having this conversation and we continue to have this conversation, I don't think, I think everyone needs to be armed with the ability to offload from the top down. 
down to the customer. When you have that front uh, end staff person working with the families, you know, they're absorbing what that family is going through and they're trying to make sure that that family has what they need. But when that front end staff person is finished with that one family or the, the 10 families they met with that day, that front end supervisor is gonna absorb what that front end staff person dealt with. So now that front end supervisor has to be armed with the ability to kind of manage and, and meet in the middle to kind of figure out, okay, now what do we do with this, this information and how do we, how do we move forward uh, by maintaining and, and dealing with our own, our, our, with the information that we've been given. How do we take care of ourselves mentally and emotionally? Uh, and it goes up the chain because now that front end supervisor has to go to their leadership and then their leadership goes on up. So it ha the, the, the communication then is key. We have to make sure that we're being open and honest about what's happening at the front end and how it's impacting every level uh, of, of what's happening um, in our programs and how we roll out our services to serve families. I think you know, that's, I mean, the way you did, like, the way you wrap that up with like how we roll out our services, I think you're absolutely right. We have to think, if we're going to think carefully and intentionally about having a trauma-informed approach to our service delivery, it has to be in our staff policy and practices too. That's where we see burnout. If we're expecting our frontline staff and service providers to have a trauma-informed approach, but we aren't replicating those approaches and this is this this work exists. We we know there are models for how to have a trauma informed meeting. What does email look like? What does paid time off look like? Right there, these exist, and so we replicate that throughout the system. One, it supports our frontline staff, and we are being cohesive, and it goes against the, that potential for the mistrust. If I'm hearing something but not experiencing it, whether I'm a recipient of services, a staff member, that's where the, that's where the lack of trust come, comes from. And so we have to have this integrated and cohesive approach in order to maintain and build great space for that trust. So quality supervision really matters. And in, in some states may be familiar with this. A long time ago, there was this model around that states put into place, counties were put into place called reflective supervision. And it, I don't think the word trauma was used, but, but what I recall was how that was a way to approach staff, listen while still holding folks accountable to whatever those accountabilities were. But it really built the relationship in a way between, that, that seems to me to be very aligned with what we're talking about today. I want to again remind our other speakers, Michael, jump in here anytime, uh, uh, um, uh, Charles, Anyone, anyone else on the line? Here's a specific question though, uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> can you recommend any simple, easy to use assessment tools that can be used with clients to identify trauma, adverse childhood experiences? And is it okay for employment services staff to use these assessments or do we need to utilize trained therapists to administer them? I love the question, it's very practical. And if you guys don't answer it, I'm going to try in a minute. So you guys go ahead. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful. It's a great question. It's such a thoughtful question. Um, yes, of course, there are many assessments that we can use. I think, and I think there's, I think there's probably a multitude of opinions about this. I'm really eager to hear what my um, co-hosts here say. But um, I think one of the wonderful things about a trauma-informed approach is that it assumes trauma without pathologizing it. And so my question would be, wait, why do we need to, what do we need to know and why? And what will we do with that information? So I think that's embedded in this question wonderfully, but a trauma-informed approach is going to assume that trauma is in the world, it's impacting the people we serve, it's impacting our staff, and so we're going to respond accordingly. We don't actually need to know people's specific experiences and stories of their trauma in order to do that. So it kind of lets us off the hook a little bit in terms of that, how do I gather your story, which I think does put us in danger of pathologizing people and their experiences. And so we use that assumed trauma approach. And then we ask the people we serve, how is this impacting you? And that might be how we, we ask our staff. I think, no matter that supervision question, I really love the little shift and instead of saying, how are you? Saying, how is this impacting you? We assume that there's an impact um, of doing the work, of being in the world. 
How is this impacting you? What feels familiar for you? What feels like a familiar challenge? We can ask these experiences around how they're able to be in the world um, in ways that both facilitate their access to our services or their access to doing the work um, and create challenges without having to ask about specific traumatic experiences. There may be, I mean, depending on the program model and the service delivery model, there may be real benefit to having some of that information. I think then it's a question of who, what is the training, what are the skill set, what are you going to do with that information? We think about privacy, confidentiality, and safety um, first before we ask the questions. Okay. Um, Jerry, you have a response to this? Uh, just to echo what Anna said, I, I mean, I agree. We've been trying to move away from um, assessments that are really too specific that could potentially re-traumatize somebody um, and kind of just assume that there's, you know, trauma in their life and, and to use more of a trauma-informed approach and in, in working with people and, and trying to, um, you know, really be non-judgmental and respect that person and the fact that they should be, you know, driving the direction of their own life and, and, and their goals. So, thanks. Anything else, Daylon or Dina or anyone else on the line? I echo what Anna and Jerry both shared. I mean, that's the work that, you know, we're currently doing and continuing to learn and build on. So, I mean, I love the responses that have been shared so far. So would you guys agree, since this question was specific about employment services staff, whose wheelhouse isn't going to be trauma-informed practice, that at least a minimum of motivational interviewing training and an orientation to this, these concepts will provide enough um, knowledge and, 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 and certainly you know, foundational skill not to turn folks into therapists, but to be sensitive. And to me, it's the questions and the assessment are part of it, but you guys have already said, questions are questions. Without the relationship that comes out of the interaction in that process, I'm hoping you're gonna agree um, that, that, that folks from almost any background can learn the basics of motivational interviewing and the base, basis, basics of how to approach folks in a trauma-informed way. Would that would I be accurate in that? <laughs> yeah, I think, Joe, I think what you're saying is like having the skills to, to film, to use a trauma informed approach, motivational interviewing is a big, can be a big part of that to build that relationship is important. And I think the other piece is, right, not to, exp not to expect people to move out of their comfort zone or out of their box of their role. Transparency is about the role is really important, right? Transparency is a part of that trauma-informed approach. Here's, this is my wheelhouse. These are my skill sets. But with that coming to accountability to know what are the resources in your community then? How do you help people access supports that you are not trained or, or expected or mandated to provide? And I think there were some questions earlier about like this community relationship building. And there's a piece there that is still a responsibility. You don't have the responsibility to come the healer, the supporter, even necessarily the information provider. But what does that look like in your service delivery model? How do you know what is available in your community and how to connect people to those services and those resources? So as we, it's not a segue, but we talk about virtual work now and technology. Um, how do you begin to deal with this question of equity and access? What are some specific strategies around uh, reaching and including uh, folks authentically in understanding what their uh, needs are and what access they have and they don't have? And this will carry us a minute, day one, into how you guys have approached it from a, from a listening to customers' perspective. But Jerry, or Anna, what, how, how, or Charlie, how do we actually deal with equity? Because we're, we're, we're finally aware of this, and I'm, I mean, I cannot believe we weren't aware, but we're finally thinking now concretely about policies and, and strategies. How do, we, how, do we, how do we cope with this? So to echo, to echo Dewan, I, I think we could do, you know, a SWOT analysis. Um, I think we need to survey and talk to customers to get the voice of the customer involved. Um, and then also looking at data to see, like, is the program, are the services being provided and, you know, based on equity? 
Um, are there are there issues with with how things are being done in, in you know different parts of the state or you know particular locality? Um, but I think you know you definitely need to do start out with an analysis and and um, definitely consider the voice of customer. Actually talk talk to customers, um, see what their opinions are, and um, and really see where where things could be improved. I mean. I think that's that's the first place to start, and it's something I think that will you know take time and and need to be um, continuously uh, evaluated um, as we go forward to ensure that equity is really being considered and changes are being made. Yeah. And also pay attention to the way we were able to move out of gatekeeping roles in the last year. How were we able to move away from the way we've done things for years because we in doing them the, because that's the way they're done and and to fast track access what does that look like getting computers in hands we heard a lot about that in our second hour you know what are the policy pieces that we've been able to adapt to be nimble with and how do we maintain that flexibility and name the value of disrupting the power differences in the gatekeeping role right it's not just about adapting to this crisis but there's a value there and how do we not just we need to hear what we're not doing externally and internally inventory our own organizations internally and we need to be able to capture the value of that disruption and how do we and how do we include that in our assessment and evaluation i think it feels like a, an important challenge to hold on to in the next year are, are there tools you're aware of to do that if an organization says yes i would like to understand how well we think about and address equity what the data is telling us where where can we go? And this is an unfair question, Anna. I don't have to pick on you or Derek. But are there places that that we we can go to find that starting points? Yes. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gonna. I don't have to answer with your menu, but I would start with your right. community. My if you are in a community, you are in a community with many people with many skills and many areas of expertise. And my guess is this work is happening already. So right. who is doing the work? How do you position your organization to hear those people, see those people, and connect with those people? And I think we've heard words about humility and vulnerability, vulnerability already. What does that look like for an organization? And how do you recognize what is already being done and amplify it? And I think I would say start locally with your community. Who is doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work in your community? Yes, you can Google an inventory. You will find many organizational inventories um, around all of these topics. And so, there are people with lived experience and expertise in your community doing the work. So, so it strikes me this is not a set of policies that can be promulgated from a state to say, here's the answer. Um, so what, how can states, Jerry, in, in day one, you're, you're in between a, a state and a city and a territory and everything else. How, how do you, how can states leverage their and support localities for going down this road, how important is communication and awareness? And just, you know, how do we how do we promote this in a way where folks that aren't just consumed with we've got to get through this problem with each, with each customer's specific needs today? We got to step back and think about stuff. What can states do? Well, I think. Well, one, I, just to look at where our where we would like our families to kind of not end their journeys, but really jumpstart their journeys. And I, I know I've said this probably before, but one language matters. And so our families are not just looking for jobs. They're looking for careers. Careers are long-term. Jo jobs are short-term. And so we have to be very intentional about what that means for the families that we're serving. Second, I think Anna spoke to it when she says, yes, there, there are probably tools that we could Google and we could find. And, you know, it's, it's not difficult to do that. But really, you know, it's looking at what, what has changed, what, uh, what industries, and I'm going to kind of move into workforce development a little bit here just to kind of frame it a little bit. But if we look at high growth industries now, we were all forced to make a change, not because we wanted to, but because we had to. So there was a learning curve for everybody. Uh, one thing, you know, I think 
you know, we're learning right now is how has technology really impacted each industry, whether it's a high growth industry or a trending industry right now, you know, how has it really been weaved into the work that they do day to day? Um, we're looking at construction, how, and, and that's a really hands-on uh, industry, how has technology really been impacted uh, based on last year's work? We know that a lot of work would have needed to shift, but what did that look like? Uh, and, and for an entry-level position for families who, you know, look at that pathway as something that they would want to go into, what new skills are we going to have to start looking at on the front end to make sure that they're well equipped? What does technology now mean uh, to them going in the door? They're going to have to look at that differently. We want to make sure that they're armed with that. So that's just a, a, on the front end, you know, it's beyond the phone now. It's, it's really having a laptop ready to go. It's having internet access um, and having those conversations. So I think what we thought uh, or where we thought pie in the sky was just not attainable, that is now attainable. So I think I say all of that to say is I think we really need to consider the pie in the sky um, when we step back and say, is that a possibility and why would it be feasible? Okay. Um, when you talk about listening to people, I think I happen to know you have a custom a customer advisory board. Yeah. You have you have you have as a real world agency um, been thoughtful about how to authentically listen and apply what you're hearing to your business model, to your customer flow, and to the things you just raised about technology needs and yep. access. Can you talk about both how that works? and also the journey to get an organization to take the time and build the culture to really listen? So just exactly to, to the example that I was making about workforce development and having those conversations, it was born from an idea that was shared from our customer panel. It was, uh, and not just specifically the technology, um, shift from last year, but just creating a platform for our customers. So whatever's happening in our agency, whether it be a new idea uh, or technology coming down the pipe, we really consider our, um, our customers to be considered stakeholders. So they have the opportunity to really have an ear uh, or have an eye to what's happening. How will this uh, impact you? How will this support you? And is this something that you foresee um, being helpful on your journey? What, what will this do for you or other residents moving forward? And so not only is it, you know, us just presenting to them, but it's, you know, what is it we can do? How can we improve where we are? And we oftentimes will listen to what it is our customers say, uh, and we'll take that and we'll start working with it. And we may come back to our customers and represent to them again, uh, sharing with them some of the changes, some of the options we've come up with, just within the parameters we have. Uh, and they'll say <laughs> yay or nay, whether it works or not. And we'll have staff kind of working on it, tooling away at it. Uh, and some ideas make it through, some of them do not. And, you know, just to speak a little to it, that's actually how we, we came up with the idea to have the conversations uh, with some of our industry leaders within the high growth industries, just to figure out, you know, what was happening with technology. Um, in construction, in uh, IT, what's happening? How is this going to create an impact? That was actually a uh, an idea that was born from one of our customers in a session last year because they were worried about going into a field of work previous, uh, pre-COVID and then post-COVID, what's going to happen? Is this now something I'm going to have to be leery of? This is something I really wanted to do. So it took a little bit of work to just figure out what that was going to look like. But again, it can happen. That was a pie in the sky before. Uh, but of course, using and leveraging things like that, we had the opportunity to really look at the organization as a whole and create systems or processes or create platforms that really benefit uh, our residents and the families that we serve. So, so give us a sense of how you meet with these stakeholders. Is this a meeting that happens twice a year? How often? How many? How, how does this actually work? And how do you vet the information back into 
change in your agency? So our customer listening sessions uh, or our advisory board is held, um, we'll, we'll schedule meetings at minimum once a month. Uh, and if there's an event uh, for our customers, sometimes they're more engaging, they're more lighthearted. Uh, we'll have cooking demonstrations with them. We would uh, talk about financial literacy or financial empowerment with them. We'll partner with local organizations to come in and, and work with them if that's something that they're asking for. It'll uh, move upward of like every two weeks and at, at most. Uh, and we'll listen to them. We'll have speakers on the calendar. And so every two weeks or once a month, we'll have the ability to really listen to them and we'll push uh, surveys into the chat. And so over the past year and a half or so, we've been doing these over Zoom. Uh, so we have the opportunity to really capture the survey. Uh, we can survey uh, our, our families and whomever's participating uh, to get a sense of what it is they like, what they don't like, who's able to participate, um, what group or bucket they're falling into if they're participating or not how best they would like to be communicated with uh, upcoming sessions. There could be a number of things we'll ask, just depending on the, uh, the previous topic. We usually try to make sure that we're following what the previous session was asking. If, uh, if customers are asking for something that's uh, looking for food resources, then we're gonna try to make sure that we tie in the next session that's really gonna focus in on food resources. If they're asking for something that's really gonna speak to you know, resource, resources that address homelessness, then we're gonna make sure that we reach in, uh, inside and make sure that we're having somebody there uh, who can address homelessness or getting connected to homeless services. Uh, parenting classes, we make sure all of those things are connected. So wherever our families are, are asking for resources, we'll make sure to get them there as well. Uh, and each ses session is uh, created in a way where they're getting information, but we're also get, uh, getting information ourselves. So they also uh, have the ability to share their own perspectives as well. We usually frame a question in the session so that they can speak freely. So uh, we have a question from the audience about this. I'll add on to it. Do you compensate parents for coming to these sessions? My question I was going to first ask was, why do people come? And do they keep coming? I mean, I mean, what do they get out of this, in your opinion? So information and the ability to really be heard. Uh, I think if there's something we all want it to be understood and to be heard. Uh, and oftentimes you are being given, or, or customers sometimes feel as though they're being given a service or provided a service and someone's not really hearing them uh, and really building that trust. And, and I know that's something we've really talked heavily about, uh, really building that trust with them. Um, but our families, predominantly our TANF customers and our TANF families, they are participating uh, with a TANF employment provider or program. So they are compensated with four hours of participation hours. So they do have the ability to get their work hours for that day. Uh, and they do, and uh, they have the opportunity to report back to their case managers and we'll send over uh, the proof that they participated to their case managers so they can get their credit for the day. I'm gonna turn it back to Jerry and Anna to uh, think about what haven't we had talked about that we should have talked about with some closing remarks. Um, real quickly, Dejan, I think it's so critical. Lots of us have put people in jobs in our careers. A lot of them move out of those jobs, come back onto SNAP or Medicaid. They don't really retain employment and grow in those jobs. What they'll take away from when you say, Folks don't want jobs, they want careers for this population particularly. They want that's for you. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, it, was break, it was breaking up a bit. That's, that's your quote. People want careers, mm -hmm. not jobs. We've all put people in jobs. Um, what, what does that mean? What are the implications for your agency when you move into really thinking about careers rather than, okay, you've got to go get a job and then you can go off to Anna? So it's, it's more not that they're not accepting the jobs. It's really, I'm sorry for not clarifying, but 
Uh, simply, it's language matters. And we oftentimes are telling our customers, or not telling our customers, but we're sharing with our families that, you know, they need to get a job. And while we were participating um, in a PACE Academy, we were working on our career pathways um, model, which we were working to blend together a coaching model as well. And in one of our focus groups, we spoke with customers and we asked them what, uh, one of our questions was really just framed around, around trying to better understand uh, how they heard or how they interpreted a job or a career and what that meant for them. Um, and when they heard job for them, it was synonymous with short term, temporary, and dead end. They didn't see any need to plan long term with a job. And so when we did it again and we started looking and, and just working with other, not other groups, but we had this broken into different groups, we started talking about careers and we asked them, okay, well, what does a career mean? Uh, they then started to react a little bit differently and we started getting different feedback and there was more excitement in the room we started getting feedback like long-term, I'm able to plan for my family. I can look at retirement. I can plan ahead. I could see a promotion. And so we started to see uh, families get more excited about planning long-term goals. So uh -huh. what, we, what we really started to do is look at not just these positions or these jobs that were a cashier or a security officer, but to really help them see the bigger picture. If I'm a home health aide, that's within the healthcare career pathway. If I'm a security officer, that's within security and law, and there is a pathway forward and up uh, to, to at one point become a security, uh, I'm sorry, a police officer or state officer. So there are pathways uh, that can be stacked upon with credentialing, with education uh, and coaching that's possible uh, if we're looking at the larger picture. And sometimes it just takes that, that trust and that relationship right. and I, more knowledge uh, to, to build on that. That, that is, I, I think it has major ramifications for this entire conversation. I've got to turn this over to Carol Notero in just one second. Anna, Jerry, any last 30 seconds of thoughts, please. Uh, I just want to echo what Dewan said about careers. I mean, we've been really trying to promote that in Ohio, too. And I think a career is something that you can support yourself long term in and have additional opportunities. And the job is just, you know, I think a lot of times people look at it as like minimum wage. Like she said, kind of a dead end job. That, that's it. So I definitely agree with that. Okay. Anna, thank you. Yeah, I think just to name it we need to be planning for longevity. We think about that with career and job. We think about the impact of this pandemic. This impact is gonna have a ripple effect economically and emotionally um, and relationally for our organizations and who we serve for years to come. And we need to use this trauma-informed model to plan to have long-term sustainable adaptation, not just acute crisis-oriented uh, crisis -oriented adaptation. So really thinking about, we can talk about everything we talked about today for years, hours at least, days, but pulling those threads together to really start to use it as a momentum to continue to adapt with increased intentionality and increased sustainability. Thank you. You guys are absolutely fantastic. We could go so many different places from here and even deeper. We're out of time. Um, yeah, so thank you for letting us have the conversation. Uh, thank you to the Office of Family Assistance. Um, I would like to turn this over now to Carol Montero, who's the Region 1 Hanna. Um, uh, program uh, manager. Um, Carol, it's all yours. Hi, um, and I apologize that I'm not on camera. I am having camera issues, but that just forced me to, to even focus more on the material that I was hearing. I, I want to say thank you to each and every presenter um, for all of the information that you've provided to the participants today. And I want to thank the participants for taking the time out. I think you've got some really good information. I was writing notes furiously, so I'm very, I certainly have a lot of information. Um, 
I, I think one thing that's been very interesting I found was that COVID has been um, an experience unlike anything any of us have ever had um, to go through. And, but I think that the positive piece that came out of, that has come out of this is that we have learned to work differently and um, go where, as Captain Kirk says, we've never gone before um, in trying to meet the needs of our, our clients. So I'm, I'm really very impressed. And for those of you that had a chance to participate in um, the other sessions as well, I, I think there's been an awful lot of great information that's been relayed. I want you to know that this is uh, being recorded, so you have the opportunity if you, you know, want to share with your staff um, or to come back and rehear something again and follow through with the presenters that that is available. I, I hope that you, you really have, uh, that this has been valuable to you and we appreciate your feedback and you know this is a partnership we have to work harder and better and you've shown us that it is doable so thank you so much steve take it away thanks carol uh, i just want to echo what carol said particularly about your your feedback there is a poll on the screen now um popping up for you shortly about the session that you just watched if you could take a few moments to fill that out and give us some feedback on the session and how we can make things better we certainly appreciate you joining for this meeting as well as the series of meetings uh there's been a wealth of information and we will do our best to get everything prepared and, and able for you to access again check Bizabo for access to materials. I think we've also posted in the chat box a share drive folder which has access to the materials as well. Uh, so we appreciate you taking out the time to join us and hope that you will all stay safe and stay healthy and continue doing the great work that you're doing. Uh, thank you and we will see you soon for the upcoming National Summit later this year. Thank you everyone.